There's a passage where the Buddha says that if you want to master jhana, get really good at right concentration, you need both tranquility and insight. In other words, you don't just force the mind down. If you want the mind to be willing to settle down, you have to understand its causes and effects. What works, what doesn't work. Remembering that the insights you have don't have necessarily have to be verbalized. After all, think about it. Insight has to do with value judgments, what's worth doing, what's not worth doing, what gets good results, what doesn't get good results. And sometimes you know that without having to verbalize too much. It's when you're cooking food, you know when something is done. And if something is not quite right with the sauce or with whatever you're making, you have an idea of what needs to be done. And some of that's not very verbalized. When you taste it and it's just right, that's all you need to know, just right. You're done. You're ready. This is one of the reasons why John Lee often talks about meditation as being like a skill, a manual skill. The knowledge of a manual skill is often very unverbalized. When you're planning some wood, your sense of what is just right, the amount, right amount of pressure to put down the plane as you run it along, how deeply to cut. It's not necessarily verbalized. You have a sense of what feels right. But it's the same with settling the mind. Get a sense of what kind of breath feels right for settling the mind. Where you want it focused, how broad you want your focus to be. Some people will verbalize this more than others. But the important thing is the skill. You remember, it took a Buddha to come up with the vocabulary that we use for our meditation. There are a lot of people who gain full awakening, the private Buddhas, who couldn't formulate the Dharma. They sensed their way into awakening recognized it when it came, but couldn't put it into words. And you look at the different foreign Sitajans, some of them are people of very few words. They don't explain much. Others are very articulate. But just because someone is articulate doesn't mean that his or her knowledge is better than someone who's not articulate. After all, freedom is not a matter of words. It comes from seeing things that you're doing for the sake of happiness and realizing they're not getting the results you want. And thinking of other things you might do. That kind of value judgment is not necessarily verbalized. But it is discernment. So as you work with the mind, try to get a sense of it. How much pressure you can put on it. How much pressure you put on the breath. So you can stay with the breath, but you don't force the breath too much. If the pressure is not right, if it's too little, you float away. So how can you stay with the breath consistently? And how can you keep the mind happy to be there consistently? The mind likes a lot of variety. And you have to train it to like being here. In a very quiet place, it's like being a watchman in a, in a forest. You're up in the watchtower, alone. And some people go there simply because they like being alone, but after a while they get hungry for human companionship. But if someone comes to visit, 
you can't let your, your vigilance down. You have to keep an eye out on the horizon all around. Because if any fires get started, you want to see them quickly. The more quickly you see them, the more easy they are to put out. So you have to develop a skill, the skill of being quiet and happy to be quiet. And you can play around with the breath. But then as the breath gets more and more subtle, there comes a point where if you really want to get the mind to settle down, you have to stop playing and just be with this all-around sense of the body. Very much one with the breath. Fortunately, the breath gives you a reward when you do that. There's a strong sense of a pleasure that goes with that. Some people even sense it as rapture. At the very least, it's refreshment. But then that too begins to seem gross and falls away. And you have to keep training the mind. This is a good place to stay. It's good to stay here. Why do you want to go anyplace else? Why are you looking for trouble? Learn how to appreciate a concentrated mind, have respect for concentration. We tell ourselves that we want well-being, and here it comes, and you get bored. So ask yourself, what's wrong with the well-being? And it will, of course, have its drawbacks. After all, concentration is not perfect. But you want to sense the ups and downs. And here again, it's not so much a mental issue of verbalizing. Just notice, when does the stress go up, when does it go down? When it goes up, what do you do? What did you do? What perception came, what feeling came in? When the stress level goes down, what perception did you let go of? Those are things that you would feel your way into. And as you let go, let go. As the Jamahambua points out, it's when you see something is not worth holding on to. It doesn't matter whether you tell yourself it's inconstant or stressful or not self, or don't say any of those things. You just have a sense, this is not worth it. That's where the real discernment lies. The terms, the perceptions, those are simply aids to help convince you that this is something you really don't want to go with, no matter how much you've liked it in the past. But if for whatever other reason you notice, it's just not worth it. Then you let go. That's the discernment. Part of our problem is that we think about understanding or knowledge having to be in words. This is reflected in the history of Western philosophy. Philosophers very quickly get into questions of what they call epistemology, the study of how we know things. And the basic paradigm for how we know things is looking at something and realizing that we formulate a lot of assumptions about things as we look at them in order to deal with them. After all, your visual field is your most active field. And so there's a lot of verbalization that goes on, simply in trying to figure out if you see something, is it true or is it not true? Is it a mirage? How do you test? If you look at Indian thought, especially prior to the Buddha, the basic paradigm was not the act of looking at something. It was the act of eating. This, they said, was the basic function of a human being, of any being, was eating. The Buddha himself said this is what we all have in common. All beings need to feed. When you're eating something, it's not the question of whether it exists or not. The fact that it's filling you up, that's 
fulfilling a function. The question is, is it healthy for you? Will it be good for you in the long term? That's a different series of questions, and that one doesn't have to be verbalized so much. Part of it is, if it tastes good, it doesn't taste good, you don't, even if you don't verbalize it beyond saying, this is, this is horrible, you spit it out. With other things, you have to be more careful. Something may taste good, but it may not be good for you. That's a whole different set of questions. But remember, a lot of eating is nonverbal. You know, a lot of discernment goes into what you should and should not eat. What this gets down to is what the Romans used to call the difference between scribe knowledge and warrior knowledge. Scribe knowledge had to be expressed in words. It was a matter of definitions. Warrior knowledge was simply a matter of knowing your skills, knowing your weapon, knowing your enemy. As you know a weapon and know an enemy, know your horse or whatever your your other aids as you fight. Sometimes you have a sense that your horse needs to rest. Well, what's how did you say that to yourself? You just know. Sometimes you get a sense of how to use your weapons. You get a sense of what your opponent is like. Often the sense is not verbalized, but it counts as knowledge. And even if the, the war that you're engaged in is doing battle with food in the kitchen, it's the same sort of thing. You get a piece of food, what do you do with it? What does it need to be? How does it need to be done? And when it's done, how do you know that it's done? You have a sense. Okay, it's the same with the mind. Have a sense of when it's ready to settle down. Have a sense of when it's not beginning to get unsettled. And that kind of knowledge, it deals with cause and effect. Which causes are worth going with, which ones are not, based on the effects. That's where the insight lies.